<laughs> pretty good. You were spoiled pretty good. Guys and girls need to remember the fact that Frankie is with me. And if you want to keep your kneecaps, I suggest you stop sending her them. I'm coming. I'm coming for you. So Star, who loved playing with her aunt, lost contact with the only people trying to protect her. She, she was crying and then she stopped crying and then she was sick. And um, now she's just a little bit floppy, to be honest with you. She like ascended from the bowels of hell and just completely devastated, wrecked our family. We all have those cases that have truly shaken us to our core, and today's case is one of those for me. It involves a level of violence that most of us could never even imagine inflicting on an adorable, innocent child. It's cases like these that remind us that there are monsters out there, and they're not always the scary-looking, creepy dude that lurks in the dark. Sometimes these monsters are right in front of our faces and you'd never know the darkness they harbor until it all comes out in the most violent, shocking way possible. But before we get into the case, I want to say a huge thank you to Cook Unity for partnering with me on today's video. Cook Unity is the first chef to customer platform delivering freshly prepared pre selected meals right to your door weekly. Cook Unity has dozens of chefs offering a wide variety of cuisines. Select from a whopping 350 meals each week. If you can't or don't have time, Cook Unity is happy to select meals for you based on your taste preferences. Chefs cook meals with real ingredients, nothing artificial. They use humanely raised meats and organic ingredients whenever possible. Browse the menu by protein, chef, cuisine, or dietary need, including vegetarian, pescatarian, and keto. You are sure to find food you'll love. I do personally eat vegetarian, and I consider myself to be a bit of a picky eater, so that's why I love that I get to select my own meals from Cook Unity, as well as try new meals that look absolutely delicious. The first meal I had was this amazing grilled naan margarita pizza with fresh basil made by John DeLucci. This one was a hit. I love how fluffy and crisp the crust was, the amount of cheese and olive oil was perfect, and of course, I love the flavor that the fresh basil adds to my favorite Friday night pizza. I also got this amazing vegan Caesar salad by chef Cami Sepulveda. I love a good Caesar salad to go on the side of a pasta dish or a pizza dish, which is another delicious meal I received. I got this rigatoni with vodka sauce, which is just yet another hit, perfectly topped with just the right amount of sauce and cheese for the perfect pasta meal. This one is also by John DeLucci. I love that the meals are delivered fully cooked, so all I have to do is heat them up. Sometimes I don't want to cook or put in the effort it takes to cook a meal and then have to clean everything up after, especially on the days where I work my 9 or 10 hour shift and then go work out for an hour after. Sometimes I'm not home until 7 or 8 and at that point, I just love being able to pop my meals in the oven and still enjoy chef cooked meals right at home. Cook Unity's roster of all-star chefs include Food Network alums, James Beard Award winners, and acclaimed restaurateurs. Balancing flavor and nutrition in their creations, there is a seemingly endless variety of meals to choose from. Cook Unity's subscription is also super flexible. You can pause or skip weeks, and you can cancel at any time, though I don't think you're going to want to. So, if you want to indulge in chef-prepped meals right at home with absolutely no effort or cleanup, go to cookunity.com rstc50 and use my code rstc50 to get 50% off your first order at Cook Unity. That's rstc, as in Rachel Shannon True Crime 50, to get 50% off your first order at Cook Unity to try it out for yourself. Thank you again so much to Cook Unity for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, Let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the absolutely heartbreaking story of Star Hobson. Star Hobson was born on May 21st, 2019 in Keithley, West Yorkshire, England to 17-year-old Frankie Smith and Jordan Hobson, whose age I am unsure of. Frankie was the oldest of five children, and she was described by her family as being a bit immature for her age. She didn't do the best in school, struggling academically, and never really finding a place to fit in. Frankie had a bit of a rough life growing up. Her father, Andrew, was known to use drugs such as heroin, and even though he always tried his best to stay involved in his children's lives and be a present father, that's obviously going to be really difficult for an addict. 
So much of Andrew's time was spent in his room alone and not really caring for his children. Eventually, Frankie went off to live with her grandmother, Anita, and her husband, David. David wasn't biologically related to Frankie, but this is who Frankie saw as her granddad and who was there for most of her life. Meanwhile, Frankie's mother, Yvonne, continued raising her four other children at home. Now, the relationship between Frankie and Star's father, Jordan, was described as on again, off again, both during Frankie's pregnancy and after Star's birth. Apparently, things between them had always been pretty volatile. Some reports state that Jordan would cheat on Frankie and had a bit of a temper so he could fly off the handle if the two got into an argument. When Star was around four months old, the two officially separated. At the time, Star continued living with her mother while Jordan lived with his own parents. He then went off to university to complete his studies. After that, he set up some visits with Star at his parents' house, but eventually, he kind of just fell off completely and stopped really trying to be involved in her life. Star was known as being a pretty easy baby who developed into a curious toddler. She loved listening to music and dancing in her little baby walker. She loved cuddling up on the couch with her family and watching Peppa Pig and eating her snacks. She always was giggling and laughing, bringing light and joy to everyone around her, especially her grandfather, Andrew Smith, and her great-grandfather, Frank Smith. When Frankie first gave birth to Little Star, those around her said she was so excited to be a mother. Obviously, when she had Star, she was extremely young. Again, she was only 17 years old, so she definitely needed help, so she ended up moving back in with her mother, Yvonne, along with her four siblings for the time being. Of course, along with the financial needs, she also needed a lot of help with physically taking care of Star, which her family was happy to provide. Her mother, father, and grandparents all stepped up to support Frankie and help with the feedings and diaper changes. They would play with her, hold her, and make sure this little bundle of joy knew she was so very loved and cared for. Frankie's family absolutely doted over this adorable baby girl. Star, do you love your mom? Do you love me? Yeah. Yeah. At first, when Star was born, Frankie was a caring, dedicated mother. However, after a few months, she started to prioritize going out and having fun over taking care of her daughter. At first, this started out with Frankie going out and drinking to all hours of the night with her mom, Yvonne. They would go on these benders, staying out all night, leaving Star and Frankie's other siblings at home with various babysitters. On one night in October of 2019, 17-year-old Frankie went to a drag queen and karaoke bar in Bradford where she met 26-year-old Savannah Brockhill, who was working at that bar as a security guard. According to later interviews, Frankie was originally drawn to Savannah because of her confident and outgoing personality. She had never actually looked at women in that way before, never having previously dated a woman or even shown interest in them. However, something about Savannah really drew Frankie to her. The two got a bit flirty with one another that night, ending the night with exchanging contact information. Within two weeks of meeting, the two started dating. Savannah Brockhill is known to come from a very well-off family. Her parents raised her alongside her four siblings in a million-dollar home in a huge compound in Lancashire, complete with luxury caravans and chalets. Some reports say that Savannah is a second or third cousin of world heavyweight boxing champion Tyson Fury. There are photos of the two with Savannah posing with an impressive $5,000 mink coat. Her family were described as travelers who lived a more transient lifestyle. This meant that Savannah left school at 10 years old to prepare for life as a homemaker. During this time, though, she started training in boxing and martial arts, eventually being granted a £1,000 per month grant to train full-time with the British women's boxing team. This took Savannah's life in a complete new direction. She had dreams of going to the Olympics one day for boxing. However, by the age of 19, Savannah was involved in a car accident that caused spinal damage, 
ruining her chances of ever going pro in boxing. After this, Savannah eventually started working as a home carer until she switched paths once again and started working as a bouncer at bars, and then she also worked as a dog handler. After Savannah and Frankie started dating, things in their relationship were iffy from the beginning. It was described as an on-again, off-again relationship from the jump. According to Savannah, at first, Frankie wouldn't tell her that she had a daughter. When she eventually met Star, she tried telling her that she was her younger sister at first until she eventually admitted that she was her daughter. Savannah also said that Frankie was a heavy drinker who used alcohol to cope with her mood swings and emotional problems. She was obsessed with Savannah, telling people that they were married and getting her name tattooed on her forearm. That was Savannah's version of their relationship. However, Frankie and her family would tell a completely different story. According to those around Frankie, pretty early on in the relationship, they noticed Savannah exhibiting controlling and possessive behaviors. Family members said that they would sometimes see Frankie with bruises on her face and body, and they just knew that they were caused by Savannah. There was one incident where the two got into a fight at a local pub, which resulted in Savannah hitting Frankie so hard that she left that pub with a chipped tooth. Not only was she physically abusive, but she seemed to be very controlling as well. Savannah had a say in everything Frankie ate and put her on a strict sleep schedule. She would threaten Frankie, saying that if another man or woman ever looked in her direction, she would be pissed. There was one time where Frankie dared to go out without Savannah, and during that time, Savannah called her numerous times, sent her over 200 messages, and even sent videos of herself saying that she wanted to stab someone that night. And Savannah was not ashamed of her possessive behaviors either. She proudly and publicly called herself a psycho, once posting a video of herself online saying, I'm a psycho when it comes to my girlfriend and wouldn't mind putting anyone in a wheelchair for the rest of their life if they so much as look at her wrongly. Keep safe. Don't message my girlfriend. Guys and girls need to remember the fact that Frankie is with me. She keeps getting a lot of message requests and friends requests. She's not going to accept. Especially tramps like you. And if you want to keep your kneecaps, I suggest you stop sending her them. She's with the number one psycho. Even with these behaviors, it seemed like the obsession kind of went both ways. Sometimes I feel like in relationships, especially when people are younger, they will see their partner's controlling and obsessive behaviors as endearing. Like, oh, they're so obsessed with me. They'd be willing to hurt anyone that flirts with me. They must really love me. And that can create an unhealthy attachment to that person. So throughout their relationship, Frankie wanted to spend all of her time with Savannah, often ignoring Star for hours at a time. As the relationship progressed though, it seems like Savannah started taking her jealousy out on Star. We see this happen sometimes in relationship where a couple has a baby and the mother starts showing that baby more attention than her partner. In unstable, often narcissistic relationships, this causes that partner to become jealous of that baby. There's a resentment towards the baby who is taking all of the attention away from them. Except in this case, it's a partner who came into a mother's life, found out she had a baby already shortly into the relationship, so this shouldn't have been a surprise. It's not like they built something up with just the two of them and then this baby came in and ruined everything. The baby was there from the very beginning, so this really shouldn't have been a surprise. Either way, this weird jealousy towards Star started as Savannah doing things like taking all of her pacifiers away because she just didn't want her using them. Then, as Star grew a bit older and her hair started coming in, those around her started admiring and gushing over her beautiful little blonde curls. Well, Savannah decided to take Star to the barber and cut her hair short so those curls wouldn't be such a distraction. Then, things grew more violent and severe. Instead of doing these little passive-aggressive things to make Star's life harder or make people give her less attention, those who lived in the home with Frankie and Star started witnessing the punishments Savannah would dole out. 
when Little Star did something wrong, Savannah would scream at her and tell her to go face the wall. Mind you, by this point, she's only a year or so old. So when Star is being punished like this, she has no idea what she did wrong. Then, younger siblings witnessed times where Savannah would hold Star in a chokehold like the ones wrestlers use as a punishment. At first, when these things started happening, everyone in the home were too afraid to say or do anything. Nobody wanted to make Savannah upset. Again, she was very strong. She was trained in fighting and she was clearly willing to use her training to abuse those around her. But beyond that, Frankie was always at Savannah's side supporting her. She told everyone that Savannah was this great girlfriend who treated her well. She paid for meals and bought Star expensive clothes. She was the best. But by January of 2020, 16-year-old Holly Jones, Frankie's friend and Star's babysitter, contacted social services with concerns of domestic violence between Frankie and Savannah, as well as with how Savannah would physically punish Star. She was also concerned with how long she would be left to babysit Star. She said that Frankie and Savannah would be gone for long stretches of time, leaving her to babysit her for much longer than she was supposed to. By January 23rd, social services reportedly visited the home to check things out, but at this time, no concerns were raised. They said that the house was well kept. Savannah and Frankie were clean and appeared to have good hygiene. Star also appeared healthy and clean. The only need identified for Star was apparently a housing accommodation, so the social worker contacted the housing department to get into contact with Frankie. From there, this case was closed. By February of 2020, Frankie and Savannah had one of their breakups. Apparently, the breakup had such an effect on Frankie that she felt she couldn't care for Star. That is when she sent Star off to live with her grandmother, Anita Smith, and her partner, David. According to Anita, when Star first arrived to their home, she had a diaper rash and she appeared sad and depressed. But after living with Anita and David for some time, Star began to thrive and appeared very happy and content. She started cruising around furniture and crawling all over the place. She loved bath time and singing with her great-grandparents. She was a happy little child. She stayed with Anita and David until April of 2020. At this time, Frankie just went over and took Star from them without any warning or discussion. This was a decision Frankie made without as much as a conversation with the people who had been caring for her for two months. Frankie took her and they both moved back in with Frankie's parents. Coincidentally, when she took Star is the same time that she started back up her relationship with Savannah. At this time, Frankie cut off contact with them, Anita and David, as well as with Star's paternal grandparents. By May of 2020, different family members grew more and more concerned with how Star was being treated by Savannah. By May 4th, Anita had heard about Savannah putting Star in a chokehold and slamming her against the wall. So, of course, she made a call to social services to report the physical abuse. The following day, social services did an unscheduled visit. However, they did let Frankie know about an hour ahead of time that they were coming. When they arrived, they spoke with Frankie about the allegations. At the time, she obviously denied the allegations and actually told the social worker that Anita was making malicious reports because she did not support same-sex relationships. It was simply a false accusation. The social worker also interviewed Yvonne, Star's grandmother, who said that she had no real concerns regarding her well-being. The social worker saw no visible injuries on Star, so no concerns were raised. Then, on Sunday, June 21st, 2020, Jordan Hobson, Star's father, actually called the authorities as well with concerns for her well-being. Apparently, there was a photo posted on Facebook of Star which showed bruising on her face. This photo was seen by a friend who then sent it to him. At the time, he was given the contact information for the social worker already assigned to Star's case, so he contacted her as well. 
When contacting social services to make the reports, Jordan expressed that he did not think that Frankie was able to take care of Star, even saying that Frankie would slap Star in the face when she was acting naughty. At this point, Frankie and Star had actually moved out of the home with Yvonne and moved in with Savannah. Officers went and spoke with Yvonne and another family member living there, and apparently Yvonne told officers that she had witnessed Savannah hitting Star in the face and expressed that she felt Savannah was too strict with Star. Other family members officers spoke to also raised concerns, saying that they saw the video of the bruises. She said that Frankie would often just leave Star in a cot all day with a dirty diaper and would ignore her. She has also heard Frankie getting in Star's face and swearing at her. Then, one of Frankie's siblings said that they had once seen Frankie slap Star across the face, basically confirming Jordan's story. It seemed like when Savannah was living with the family, everybody was too afraid to tell the officers what was really going on, which is why they kept saying they saw no concerns. But it seems like after they moved out is when family members were more willing to speak about what was really going on. Officers then went to Savannah's and spoke with her and Frankie. At that time, officers did see three bruises on Little Star's face. They saw a small bruise to her right temple and another on her cheek, which officers noted could be from an open hand slapping her on her face. There were also two bruises on the back of her right thigh. But Frankie said that the bruises were actually caused by Star falling and hitting her head on a coffee table. At the time, officers did not think that those bruises were consistent with the fall on the coffee table. They believed them to be from abuse. So, they contacted a medical assessment team who took her to a hospital and conducted their assessment that same day. They actually determined that Star's injuries were in fact consistent with the story Frankie gave. The bruises on her face were from a fall, and the bruises on her legs were from their new puppy, apparently. From there, Star was discharged from the hospital back into her mother's care. As that was happening, social services did contact Yvonne and the other family members who spoke with police. Yvonne said that she thinks Savannah has gotten into Frankie's head and she didn't think Star was safe living with them alone. The sibling said that Savannah had been intimidating the rest of the family, so again, they had been too scared to come forward with the allegations before, but now they really felt that Star was not safe. But when speaking with Frankie again, Frankie said that because she had just moved out of the family home, because she took Star out of the care of Anita, she felt that people were making these malicious claims. Her family was upset with her. Because of this, Frankie said that her family would not be seeing Star for quite some time because they are disrupting their relationship with her and Savannah. So again, she was basically just saying that people were making these malicious accusations for no reason other than the fact that she moved out and wasn't allowing her to see them. By July 8th, social workers found that the allegations of abuse were unsubstantiated and closed the case. They marked that report from Anita as malicious. By late August, Star was being babysat by a family friend. The friend noticed that Star had some bruising on her face that looked like finger marks, as if she had been hit. The friend took a video of those marks and sent it to one of Frankie's siblings, who then sent that video to David Fawcett, Star's great-grandfather, the same man who had cared for her for about a month. By August 28th, David contacted social services to report those bruises. At the same time, someone had also sent Star's father, Jordan, that same video, and he too contacted social services on the 30th of August. By August 31st, social services tried to get into contact with Frankie, but were told that Frankie, Savannah, and Star were on a family trip to Scotland at the time. While on the family vacation on September 1st, Frankie called her general practitioner to notify them that Star had fallen on some cobbled steps and cut her lip. Her lip was bleeding and swollen, so she was worried. Her doctor told her to call NHS 111 to direct her to the right place to go for care because the doctor's office was closing at the time of the call. 
At this time, Starr's doctor did make a safeguarding note. That following day, by September 2nd, David contacted social services again to notify them about the bruises, sending them that video to prove what they were seeing. However, a social worker got back into contact with David and told them that someone had already been notified, and they were told that the bruises were caused by her falling on the stairs. They told David that Star's doctor was notified, who advised Frankie to contact 111 to get the concerns treated. But after telling David all that, the social worker looked further into the concerns and noted that Frankie never called 111 to report the injuries or to get any further help. She also noted that this is the second time that bruising had been reported, which is a red flag. So, a social worker was sent to the home to make a home visit to check in. The worker called Frankie to arrange a home visit, and Frankie told them that they would be out of town until September 4th, so the visit was set for that day. Star's doctor also called and asked if they could come in for a visit or even do a virtual visit since they were out of town, but... Frankie declined. By September 4th, that social worker did follow up with Frankie and Star. This social worker had actually not seen the video of the bruises at that point, only had heard the concerns in the report. At the visit, the social worker deemed the home to be clean, tidy, and warm. Star appeared to have a healthy attachment to her mother. Frankie happily stripped Star down and allowed for her to be assessed, and the social worker did notice some bruising on her, but deemed it to be normal bruising that a child may sustain from falling and playing. Once again, by September 15th, the report from David was deemed to be malicious, and no concerns were raised. Absolutely in. Sane. By this point, there have been a total of five referrals made to social services regarding possible abuse of STAR. During all of these reports, the various family members all stated that they either witnessed the abuse, such as Savannah or Frankie slapping or punching STAR, or they had seen the bruises and knew they weren't caused from falls. STAR's great-grandparents continued calling social services and said that they know something horrible will happen to Star if nobody listens. Even Yvonne and Frankie's siblings were calling and saying that Star was being abused while living in the home with them. Yet each and every time, the case was closed and the allegations were unsubstantiated. In part, some of this may have been because of COVID and various restrictions caused by COVID. For example, some of the visits and interviews with Frankie were virtual. Obviously, when you're online, it's impossible to get a full picture of someone's home environment. Then, when they were in-person visits, parts of the home would be sectioned off and workers were told that they can't go there because of COVID, so there were areas of the home that simply weren't inspected. Things like this all made it so Star's case, along with so many other cases around this time, were not being thoroughly investigated. More on this later. For the weeks that followed that last September 4th visit, no further concerns were raised. However, everything took a tragic yet unsurprising turn on September 22nd, 2020, when 999 received a call from Savannah to report that 16-month-old baby star was hurt and struggling to breathe. In the call, Savannah calmly tells the dispatcher that she was in the kitchen and the baby's mother was in another room when she heard a bang coming from the living room. When she went into the room, she saw a star on the floor. She said that she must have fallen off of the couch or banged the table or something like that. She explained that she attempted CPR, but star isn't doing well. I'm in the service. Is the patient breathing? Uh, yes, yeah, she's breathing. Is she conscious? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, she's set, um, a bit of both really, basically, it's me partner's daughter, who's my little girl as well, I brought her up, um, we've got all three children here playing, and uh, I was in the kitchen making a coffee, and they've been in the living room, and I heard uh, a bang, so I came, came out, and the little lad stood there, and the little girl's on the floor, and, um, she she was crying and then she stopped crying and then she was sick and now she's just a little bit floppy to be honest with you. And what do you know how what the bang was? Uh, no, I don't know what the, I don't know if she's fallen off the off of the sofa. 
or I don't know. Just, just the thing, there were three of them playing with us. And right. he, just, he just said, start. And when I walked in, she was led on the floor. Trust darling. So you heard a bang, the patient was on the floor. I've heard a bang, yeah. I came in, and the little lad was saying, star, which is the little girl. Yeah. So I've, I've obviously, I've, I've, I shouted the mum in, so sit up, star. So I sat her up. And I started to rub her back because she was, like, breathing but, like, struggling. Yeah. So I was rubbing her back. Um, she started to be sick. So I led her on the floor. Yeah. Put her in, like, CPR position, started to run, run her back. Um, she started to lose lose breath. So I performed CPR on her. So you've done CPR on her? Yeah, I've done CPR. I've got her in the position, the recovery position, now. By the time first responders arrived, they found Little Star lying on the floor, unresponsive. At that time, it was clear that she had been covered in bruises on her face, abdomen, back, arms, and legs. Medics rushed the baby to the hospital in hopes of saving her life, but by the time they got there, they realized that Star was already dead. There was nothing they could do to save her life. After Star's tragic death, of course, she was examined at the hospital and then she was sent to the medical examiner for an autopsy to determine her cause of death. And what Baby Star had suffered before her death is just horrific. So I want to give you now as a warning that what you are about to hear is extremely disturbing and that puts it lightly. Star was found to have suffered a severe injury to her abdominal cavity, which resulted in extensive organ damage. First, her vena cava, the main blood vessel taking blood back to the heart, had been ruptured. This meant that more than 50% of Star's circulating blood was filling her abdomen, meaning she had extreme internal bleeding. She also had damage to her liver and kidneys. The medical examiner determined that these injuries were most likely caused by a punch, kick, or stomp to her abdomen. Her cause of death was due to catastrophic, non-accidental, unsurvivable abdominal injuries caused by blunt force trauma. In addition to these acute injuries that caused Star's death, the medical examiner also found several older injuries. She was found to have at least two brain injuries, a skull fracture, and multiple rib fractures. She was also found to have an old healed fracture to her tibia, which is your lower leg bone, which was then re-fractured at a later time. This baby had endured horrific violent abuse for weeks, if not months, before her tragic, brutal death. Now, after that hospital visit with Star dying, of course, both Frankie and Savannah went in for questioning. In Frankie's interview, she told police that she loved Star more than anything in the world. She would do anything for her. Every bit of money she had went towards her. She would never willingly let anything bad happen to her. When she was asked about the numerous reports made to social services, she said that every time an accusation was made, she knew the case would be closed because she knew that she wasn't abusing her daughter. The reports didn't bother her because she knew she was doing nothing wrong. Then, when asked about her relationship with Savannah, she said it was good for the most part. They loved each other and Savannah loved Star. But then, when asked about if Savannah ever abused her or Star, she did say that she would sometimes backhand her or Star. She said that Savannah didn't know her own strength, so sometimes she would be a bit hard on her and the baby. She could also be controlling at times, checking her phone to see if anybody had texted her, blocking people on her social medias, and always checking in on her everywhere she went. She told police about a time that Savannah gave her two black eyes because she went out without her once and didn't text her when she got home because her phone was dead. That night, Savannah showed up and gave her a good backhand. But again, she said that Savannah never meant to leave a mark. She just didn't know her own strength. And after her outbursts, things would always go back to normal. She was intimidated by Savannah, but she maintained that Savannah was not the cause of Star's death. 
She maintained the story that Star was in the living room while Savannah was in the kitchen and Frankie was in another room. Star must have fallen when she was unsupervised. In Savannah's interview, she told the police that she loved Star as if she were her own. She was protective over her. She would have done anything for her. She loved her to bits. She also maintained that she would never hurt Star and that she must have died from a fall. She said that she may have caused some abdominal injuries when she did CPR because she may have accidentally done it to her abdomen rather than her chest, but otherwise, she never would have hurt that baby. However, right away, police knew that there was more going on here. They saw the injuries that that little baby had and knew they weren't just caused by some bad CPR. Of course, at this point, they started their investigation into what really happened to this baby and who truly was the cause of her death. Immediately upon starting their investigation, police learned of the numerous social services reports made on Star's behalf. They knew that there was this ongoing suspicion of Star being abused and she was seen with bruising for months before her death. This was obviously the first red flag. So, police looked further into the movements of Savannah and Frankie in the weeks before her death, and they actually found several videos, all which proved mistreatment of Star. In one video recorded on one of their phones, they saw as Star was sitting on a flimsy chair before falling off and hitting her head. In the video, they heard as Savannah and Frankie both laughed and just let her lie there before actually helping her get back up. This video was sent to friends and they all said it was just hilarious that they let their child fall and hit her head. Then there was another video where Star was seen on the couch with a bowl of cereal in her lap. Star was so exhausted in that video that she fell asleep and went face first into the cereal. Once again, they just laughed and let her lie in that cereal before helping her out. Then by September 12th and 13th, 2020, just over a week before Star's death, Investigators found out that Savannah, Frankie, and Star all went to Doncaster for the weekend because Savannah was working as a security guard at a recycling plant. There, Star was being cared for solely by Savannah for parts of the day. Investigators actually found CCTV footage from Savannah's place of work that showed, over the course of multiple hours, multiple instances in which Savannah slapped and punched Star in the face and body. Then, when searching their computer. They also found Google searches for things like, can you die from being winded? And what happens when you get winded? It's thought that these multiple attacks on Star caused bruising to her face, arms, and hands, as well as caused those multiple broken ribs. So again, a week before her death. This would make sense that she would be winded if she was punched in the stomach and sustained broken ribs from it. There were also multiple other Google searches from Savannah from around July, so months before her death, and around when those social services calls were made that asked how to cover bruises, how to decrease swelling, and how to get rid of bruises. Again, showing that Savannah knew what she was doing and was trying to cover it up. Then they found even more Google searches on Savannah's phone from September 22nd, the day of Star's horrific death. They found that after Star was beaten, instead of calling 999 right away, Savannah made Google searches for home remedies for the serious fatal injuries Star had sustained. It showed that Savannah and Frankie waited 11 minutes after Star sustained these injuries to call emergency services. So based on everything we've discussed up to this point, with multiple witnesses talking about Savannah's prolonged abuse, the social services visits, the CCTV footage showing Savannah punching the baby, the Google searches, as well as the autopsy showing the violent attack, Savannah was determined to be the one who landed the fatal blow that ended Star's life, and she was charged with her murder. Meanwhile, Frankie was charged with allowing the death of her child. The trial for these charges started in December of 2021. Both women were tried together, so I will be discussing the trial as a whole, and then of course, what each woman argued on their side. The prosecution brought up everything that we've discussed up to this point, pointing the majority of the blame on Savannah for Star's death, as well as the ongoing abuse that occurred in the months prior. 
the controlling nature of Savannah's relationship with Frankie. She was prone to outbursts. She was a self-proclaimed psycho, even. She was known by family members of Frankie's to physically abuse both Frankie and Star and intimidate the family. During the course of those social services investigations, both Frankie and Savannah were able to lie and cover Savannah's tracks. One thing that I want to point out is that each and every time social services visited the home, they had time to clean the house, star, and cover what they did to her. Even in the unscheduled visit, i.e. a visit that is supposed to be a total surprise, the worker called an hour ahead of time to notify them that they were on the way. That gave them the hour to bathe Star, clean the house, and cover her injuries, all helping them to make their story more believable to the point that they got away from five different investigations. Star suffered from countless injuries throughout her time being under Frankie and Savannah's care. We already discussed many of them, so I won't get too much into it again because as you heard, the details are awful. She suffered every single day until the fateful evening of her death when Savannah's rage grew out of control to the point where she either punched, kicked, or stomped on this baby's abdomen so hard that it ruptured one of the most important vessels in your body. The medical examiner testified at trial that the amount of force Savannah used was similar to the force caused from a car accident. Of course, as Star was being viciously abused, Star's mother, Frankie, was allowing it. As we heard from earlier, Frankie was not the loving, doting mother she tried to pass herself off as. She would rather go out and drink with her mom and friends, leaving Star with babysitters and relatives for hours on end. Sometimes she even ignored Star and left her on her own for hours as she hung out with Savannah or talked on the phone with her. Clearly, her priorities were not in the right places. Now, of course, Savannah's defense was that she loved Star and would never hurt her. She claimed that Frankie was the one who was abusive and that she was the one who murdered her own daughter while Savannah was in another room. However, Frankie's defense claimed that she was being controlled and manipulated by Savannah from the very start. To remind you, when she met Savannah, Frankie was only 17 years old while Savannah was 26. Already, there is an imbalance when there's such an age difference. 10 years, 9 years isn't a ton when you are fully an adult, like maybe a 30 and a 40-year-old, but a 17-year-old and a 26-year-old is not okay. But beyond that, her defense claimed that Frankie actually had a very low IQ of only 70, so that left her much more susceptible than the average person to allow Savannah to manipulate her. According to Frankie's family, as I stated earlier, Frankie never did well in school. She was always behind her peers, even still playing with dolls at the age of 16. Then, a clinical psychologist testified that Frankie did, in fact, have a low IQ, making her more compliant to authority and always seeking validation. Due to her age and her low IQ, it was easy for Frankie to forget her responsibilities as a parent and instead focus on getting attention from Savannah and enjoying herself. And once again, there was testimony to prove that Savannah was the type of person who took advantage of everybody around her. She probably knew that Frankie could be easily manipulated, which may be why she was in a relationship with her to begin with. That accompanied by her physical strength and the fact that she was quick to anger. That made it so Frankie feared Savannah. That is why Frankie never stepped in to stop her from hurting Star. That's pretty much everything we heard in the trial. I won't make you sit here and listen to the horrific details again. Just know that everything we've discussed in this video was presented at trial before both sides made their closing arguments and the jury was sent off for deliberation. And when they came back, they found that both women were guilty of their charges. Savannah was guilty for the murder of a 16-month-old star, and Frankie was guilty of allowing it to happen. Next came time for the sentencing. When it was time for Star's family to speak, they really didn't hold back. They made it clear that they think Savannah is a monster. She is absolutely pure evil. She made her way into their lives and destroyed everything, making a pure, innocent little girl suffer for months on end. 
so many people were willing and able to step in. There were people who went out of their way and tried to take care of that baby when they knew Frankie wasn't capable. But somehow, Savannah always got her way. She wanted that baby in her care so she could abuse her and do whatever she wanted to her until she took it way too far and murdered that sweet angel. Meanwhile, they described Frankie as a girl who never grew up, whose personality completely changed after meeting Savannah. She wasn't and isn't a violent person. She never wanted to hurt her baby. None of this would have ever happened if it weren't for Savannah. I'm just pleased that uh, we got uh, a murder conviction for Savannah Brockhill because to me she was just pure evil. just can't believe she could do something like that to a baby girl. It was like, as I say, we were ju just a quiet, lovely family and she like ascended from the bowels of hell and just completely devastated, wrecked our family and took poor baby star's life. And it's like we said, I know Frankie, she, she could have got her out of that situation, but if Frankie had never met Savannah Brockhill, none of this had never have happened. And we wouldn't have been here today talking about it. She was coerced, bullied, yes, abused. So we saw Frankie covered in bruises long before things started happening with the uh, star. So we knew, we knew then, you know, it's, something's not right. We, we did our best, but she was isolated. She took her away from us in Bailden to Keithley, took stars, blocked all his phones. So we were no contact. It was just a classic case of brainwashing and absolutely. Seen here with Alicia, she was very loved and looked out for by her extended family. She loved music. Uh, my granddad would play the guitar and my nan had this thing in the kitchen. It was like um, a, a washing dryer and she'd always bang it and make noise. She loved music and dancing. Frankie's my sister, but no matter what, I have to, when you get a gut feeling, you have to follow your gut feeling. Star had a little bruise on her cheek, a little tiny, and it easily could have been from just a fall, that a bruise like that. It was a tiny, tiny little um, bruise, but I just, I don't know, I just knew something wasn't right. Social services believed Smith and Brockhill's assertions that the family was being malicious. I'm coming. I'm coming for you. <laughs> so Star, who loved playing with her aunt, lost contact with the only people trying to protect her. Meanwhile, the judge in this case had a lot to say as well. She spoke about how this abusive Star that ended her life wasn't just an isolated incident. No, it was just another instant of abuse that had been occurring for the majority of Sweet Star's life. Savannah is a controlling, manipulative monster who used those around her and took her anger out on a baby who did absolutely nothing to deserve the treatment she got. The judge also talked about how, yes, Frankie is easily manipulated. She was not the driving force in the abuse towards her daughter. However, she wasn't so afraid of Savannah that she couldn't stop it. There were so many things she could have done. She could have broken up with her and reported her. She could have lived with her family who would have and even tried to support her. She could have allowed Star to stay with Anita and David who loved and cherished Star. She could have reported the abuse during one of the five visits they got from social services. But instead, Frankie stood by and let it happen. She did nothing to stop the abuse she knew Savannah was inflicting on that baby. And if we're being honest, she also inflicted some of that abuse on Star, according to what family members have said. At the end of the sentencing phase, Savannah was handed a life sentence with a minimum of 25 years behind bars before she will be eligible for release. Frankie was sentenced to eight years behind bars and she must serve at least two thirds of her sentence before she is eligible for release. When being handed down the verdict and sentencing, it was said that Savannah showed absolutely no emotion. She showed no remorse throughout the entire trial. She didn't own up to her actions. She did not care about what happened to Star. In fact, 
there were multiple times where she was seen smiling and even waving at Frankie's family members as they were clearly suffering from this loss. She was haunting people in that courtroom. Since starting her prison term, it was said that Savannah walks around being surrounded by security personnel to avoid being assaulted in prison. Despite this, Savannah walks around with a smile and says that she's enjoying her time in prison. In the interviews she's done after the trial, she continues to place the blame on Frankie and takes no responsibility for her part in this. Despite Savannah putting on a strong front though, I know she's suffering inside. I think she's one of those people who needs everyone around them to think they are okay. She can't let anyone know that deep down, she knows she's responsible for a horrific, brutal death because she's messed up in the head and can't control her own emotions. I know whatever smile she has on in that prison is a fake one, and I'm so confident in that. I also think that Frankie's sentence was not nearly enough. Her family has said that they're ready to take her back when she's out, but I think she should be in prison so much longer and I don't see how anyone could forgive her for her role in this, but many of her family members truly believe that she was just so manipulated that that's how this all happened. Another part of this case I wanted to touch on is something I feel like we don't talk about nearly often enough, which is just how bad these tragedies affect the families and loved ones of the victim. As we heard from before, Frankie's father, Andrew Smith, had a history of drug use. Well, after the tragic death of his granddaughter, Andrew found himself in a state where he just couldn't handle what happened. I do want to note that when Frankie was a little bit older, and especially after Star was born, he was in recovery and he at least was using a lot less or he wasn't using it all and it wasn't affecting his life anymore and he was able to step in a lot more as a father and grandfather. But after the death of Star, he just could not get over the suffering his grandbaby went through. It ate at him every single day until ultimately Andrew took his own life. Andrew actually wrote a note to Frankie and sent it to her in prison saying, quote, you look after yourself and I'll look after the baby before he overdosed on Frankie's birthday. When Andrew was found, he had Star's coat right beside him and there was a handprint on his window that Star had made that he had never had the heart to clean off. He was just holding on to Star as closely as he could. Of course, this is just yet another tragic, unnecessary death that could have been prevented had this case not gone the way that it did. As for social services part in this, there was an inquest done into how this case was handled. And at this point, I'm kind of tired of talking about all of these inquests because they all find the same things. This case was severely mishandled. There were so many many missed opportunities to save that baby's life. They had the most gullible people investigating the case somehow who just kept taking the family's word for it as if they were about to admit that they were causing this poor baby's bruises. They went to someone's door, see bruises all over their baby's face and legs, and they say, oh, it was a fall. And they're like, oh, crap, I thought it might have been abuse. Thank you for telling me. Thank you for telling me it was actually just from a fall. I really thought it was abuse until you told me. Thank you for telling me that because I know you're being totally honest. So many things were missed due to incompetence, laziness, and people just flat out sucking at their jobs and ignoring the glaring red flags. The inquest found many areas that need improvement and all I can say is that I really hope Star's case has caused positive change that can prevent this type of thing from happening to any other children like her. But that is all of the information I have on today's case. I know this was a really tough one to sit through. I know hearing all the suffering this adorable baby went through was heartbreaking, but these are the cases we need to keep talking about. These are the cases where change can happen. If you see something, say something, and if your words are being ignored, then talk louder. So many people tried helping this baby and it's so unfortunate that the system failed her so miserable. But I hope that this case can be an example for anyone who works in the system and works with cases like this one, that if family members, babysitters, friends, all have the same concerns, 
they are probably right. Obviously, Star didn't deserve any of this, and I hope her case can inspire some positive change. I can sit on my soapbox about how badly she was failed all day, but that is where I'm going to leave it for today's case because I know you all agree and you can see just how horrible this case was handled. But now I want to know what you all think. How do you think Savannah and Frankie were able to cover up the abuse from social services for so long? What do you think could have been done to prevent this? Do you agree with the courts that Savannah was the one who murdered Star? Or do you think that Frankie bears equal responsibility? Or do you think that Frankie truly was too low IQ to do anything and that Savannah just manipulated her and intimidated her that badly? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.